So this is actually the 10th episode of the CCG China and the Globalization in the Time of Coronavirus webinar series. Uh, my name is Wang Hui Yao, and I'm the president of Center for China and Globalization, and I will be uh, chairing this section with uh, Mr. Toby Simon, president of uh, St. Jerak Foundation, a premier India NGO uh, based, a think tank based on global geopolitical issues. So thanks, uh, Toby, for co uh, host this uh, seminar. As we all know that uh, COVID-19 has affected over 4.6 million uh, people worldwide and uh, killed over 300,000 people uh, uh, worldwide as well. And, and actually, uh, India has uh, reported 81,000 cases and uh, uh, 2,600 deaths. So I think that while India company is busy to contain the spread of virus, uh, and, and also China is busy also uh, contain and also revive the economy. Um, many see Indian and China ties, which were due to celebrate the 70th anniversary of the diplomatic relation. Uh, this April actually took a hit uh, among this coronavirus and, uh, and also uh, controversies emerged from issues such as FDI rules and, uh, and also pharmaceuticals. Uh, so there's a lot of opportunity, a lot of uh, 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 challenges ahead uh, against this uh, background. So today's seminar will feature three main topics, basically. First is how India and China can work together to fight against the COVID-19. Second, how China and India uh, actually uh, business view the challenges and opportunities posed by the pandemic. And third topic would be uh, the role of China-India cooperation in the future of Asia. Yeah. So, and then we will have uh, opening, uh, so this is including the opening section. Uh, we will hear from um, Ambassador Rao, Ambassador Sun, and, uh, and, and, and of course, uh, uh, at the end of the seminar, Toby and I will also uh, back for some closing. Uh, so, so I think this is really a great opportunity and uh, being China and India as the uh, two largest uh, uh, country in Asia and uh, also uh, two most populous country in the world. Uh, there's, there's every reason that uh, we can work together and uh, for the well-being of, uh, of Asia and also for the well-being of the world. So, um, uh, uh, so for this uh, webinar, it's so meaningful that uh, it's probably one of the first webinars uh, the Chinese think tanks and the Indian think tank that actually co-hosted uh, for the during the pandemic crisis, and I'm sure this would uh, stimulating a lot of uh, new thinking. It would generate a lot of a new thought, and also it helps the uh, promote understanding and uh, uh, also the exchanges among the thinkers and leaders and uh, and uh, policymakers and business community uh, between the two countries. So, so, so today we are very fortunate. We had two ambassador, uh, as we all know, that ambassador Sun is. Uh, is a veteran diplomat, he was a foremost spokesperson for the Minister of Foreign Affairs. He's also ambassador to uh, India before and also among his uh, other ambassador posts like in Italy, in Afghanistan, and, uh, and a number of countries. So, so but first, uh, you know, uh, we would like to have uh, Ambassador Rao uh, to, uh, to speak. Maybe I can briefly introduce Ambassador Rao. Uh, ambassador Rao was a former Indian Foreign Secretary and also Ambassador uh, Rao was the first woman spokesperson uh, in the Minister of Foreign Affairs. So I have a lot of similarity with um, <laughs> Ambassador Shun, uh, uh, both ha has been the spokesperson. Uh, um, and also Ambassador Rao was the first woman high commissioner uh, from India to Sri Lanka, and uh, also the first Indian woman ambassador to the People's Republic of China. So, so Ambassador Rao knows China very well. She served as an Indian Foreign Secretary from 2009 to 2011. So at the end of the term, he was appointed the Indian's ambassador to the United States. So he's not only knows China, but also knows the United States. Uh, she's the member of the Advisory Council of Women in Public Service Project, 
uh, the Wilson Center, Washington, D.C. He also serves as independent director of the uh, board of several prominent Indian corporations. Uh, we are also, CCG has the pressure of welcoming Ambassador Rao uh, at CCG <laughs> venue uh, uh, some time ago, and she made a very good speech uh, by then. So without further ado, I, may, I introduce, uh, may I introduce or invite Ambassador Rao to speak first? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Wang, for those words of introduction and your warm welcome. It's wonderful to connect with CCG again. Ambassador Sun and my good friend, Toby, uh, it is, I think, a very opportune moment for us to be meeting today uh, virtually because the times are difficult and the situation is quite challenging and unprecedented. But uh, this is a good time for India and China to be exchanging notes and to reflect uh, not only on the challenges that we face currently, but also to craft a vision and a strategy for the future, because it is only by thinking of the future that we can craft a proper strategy and realize the goals we have in mind. So my talk today is entitled India and China, a text in the time of COVID-19. Early this week, I participated in an event held in China, Japan, and Indonesia via Zoom to commemorate the birthday of Rabindranath Tagore, the poet, artist, novelist, and musician, a true Renaissance man whose work is loved and remembered to this day in both India and China. Tagore, rightly emphasize the, <coughs> the civilizational threads that bind us together to this day, despite the ups and downs of geopolitics and global competition. <coughs> Excuse me. Tagore's ideal was the universal human spirit linked by reason and rationality and rising above the narrow confines of nationalism. Today, as we are ravaged every corner of the world by a virus that seeks every human being out with a vengeance, we will do well to be reminded of the need for rationality, for the respect of universality that rises above the narrow confines of cartographic borders. The world is on edge. We are on the brink of what could be a cataclysm that is both societal and economic, that tests our power of human resilience. And yet, as countries, as nations, we act as if it is business as usual, that we can pursue our outstanding differences, unresolved problems, old grievances, and rivalries in the race towards global leadership or regional supremacy, as if the world is not in need of emergency help. Insularity, the chase of narrow ambition, jockeying for spheres of influence, instead of interdependence, seem to determine our favored route. The speed with which the disaster the anthropological threat that is COVID-19 has overwhelmed us and should induce much greater sobriety in our thinking. There is a game of global finger pointing that is going on and countries like the United States and China, the leading powers, have also succumbed to this exercise that is bound to infuse the current situation with even greater complexity. The grammar of so-called diplomatic language has descended into depths that reduce it to street insults. This only compounds the tragedy we face because grown-up nations are supposed to behave like grown-ups. Where there should be convergence, there is divergence and dissatisfaction. Populism is the natural backlash from the dislocation we see. 
many worlds are colliding. What is diplomacy without a strategy, without a vision? And a vision is really defined by the goals we plan for the future. We have to think about a future when we chart a vision and plan a strategy. What is the future that we want? It is not about kicking the can down the road. Two to three years from now, what is the world we want to see? Now, India and China have a complex relationship. We are two Asian giants, but with irksome frequency, our interaction is fraught with tugs and pulls, with repetitive suspicion, with issues that have defied resolution, despite all the positive outcomes that capture media headlines when our leaders meet informally or formally. This year, 2020, we are commemorating 70 years of the establishment of our diplomatic relations. Who would have thought what an abnormal year this would turn out to be because the global pandemic had other plans for all of us? To top that, the news from the Himalayan borders we share where tempers have been unfortunately raised, has not given us any cause to celebrate. In both our countries, new generations of young Indians and Chinese have grown up on a diet of strong nationalism, quite different from the vision of Tagore. And despite the processes of globalization that like a tide, have lifted up boats in both nations, we see this phenomenon. Through history, we were not known as nations which practiced hegemony or indulged in armed conquest. Rather, we were purveyors of civilizational values, of peaceful commerce and rich cultural traditions. But looking back on the last 70 years, we were seemingly intent on charting a course more in line with habits and practices imported from Western history. The precepts of Westphalia seem to override the principles of equality and mutual benefit, and the peaceful coexistence that was what the great Sakyamuni preached to us 2,500 years ago. Will the pandemic teach us lessons? As a planet, we are looking over a precipice. Our relationship as India and China, despite our differences, is too important to squander. The issues that should determine our future are questions of peace, not conflict. We have to disprove theories like the Thucydides tra trap, although in the present context, it has not been applied precisely to our two countries. After all, just contemplate, are we, as two Asian civilizations, not to draw strength from our own rich metrics and vocabulary of millennial coexistence? The war between Athens and Sparta cannot be a paradigm for 21st century Asia. A few days ago, the anniversary of the May 4th, 1919 events in China was marked. The spirit of the young men and women of China who led that movement is remembered to this day. Their quest for scientific inquiry, modernization, development, freedom from bondage, and equality for all. Our youth must be guided by that spirit of constructive cooperation rather than mutually wasting and narrow definitions of interest. So how do we envision our future? What is our vision? What is our strategy? We have to ensure that there are self-correcting mechanisms that are built into our relationship that will prevent it from becoming prey to self-destructive threats of conflict. The trade and investment relationship we have built over the last two decades 
must serve the cause of our peoples, not just mercantilist interests. We are young nations and our young people must not be denied livelihoods, skill enhancement, access to the fruits of technological advancement and progress. Public health and education must become the new frontiers of our cooperation. Cooperation in scientific research, new technologies that have mass application and benefits, including in urban development and mass transportation, environment protection and pollution control, climate change and renewable resources, biotech, pharmaceuticals, electronics and communications should form a part of our bilateral relationship. Ours can be an example of cooperation that sustains the best aspects of globalization for the development of our societies. Just two days ago, some 100 and more global leaders and opinion makers advocated the absolute need for a COVID-19 vaccine, which when developed would be available to all, patent-free, produced at scale, and made available at no cost to people everywhere. This people's vaccine should be our goal, and we must pool our energies, our scientific talents, our resources, both human and material, to achieve this goal. This is the time to put the world first, not our individual nations. Similarly, in my view, and I speak as a citizen of India, we should institute an impartial inquiry into the origins of the pandemic so that step by step, we understand the processes of its spread and so that we can develop foolproof protocols for the handling of such situations in the future for the benefit of humanity as a whole. All this requires us to choose reform, reform of our fixed approaches and ideas, because it is a calamity that stares us in the face otherwise. As the historian Margaret Macmillan said recently, the river of history is changing direction, and we need moral leadership instead of the vacuum that surrounds us and is so suffocating. The fragility of human existence is so real today. Multilateralism that eschews hegemony needs strengthening and preserving. The world needs caravans of fellow pilgrims and team members, not lone rangers. The big and strong cannot bully the small and the weak. Organizations like the World Health Organization cannot be dismissed because, or just because its work during the pandemic could have been better. We need the WHO to come up with sensible strategies to combat the pandemic and to develop global protocols for mitigation, treatment, and prevention of the disease as also against future biological threats. Our economies, our cultural foundations, the welfare of our populations must not be weakened or destroyed. More than ever, the challenge requires wise leadership. Let me say again, moral leadership, humility, determination, good transparent governance, and the abandonment of rigidity and inflexibility. This is not the time for drawing of swords in any part of the world, except against the virus. I do hope the future is built on a balanced partnership between India and China as mutually responsible countries that work for a world order that is inclusive, open, compassionate, development-oriented, and respects diversity and the rule of international law. The time has come for us to seek the better angels in our nature and to give up the default reactions that were our definition of diplomatic refuge in the past. We must build middle ground in a polarized world and stress the core values that hold us together as humanity. We have to start drawing that map now if we are to build 
a strategy for the future. And so we know how to reach our destination and establish how interconnected we all are. That, my friends, could be the start of a Himalayan consensus between India and China that can apply for the world. Let me end as I started with Tagore. When he came to China in 1924, he asked, I quote, where is the difference between China and India, unquote. In Beijing, where an almost inconceivable crowd turned up to greet him at the station, he was felicitated by a gathering of scholars led by Liang Qichao, who spoke of Indians and Chinese as brothers, anticipating the slogan of the 1950s, but with much more intellectual depth and feeling. In Liang's words, I quote, we are brothers, India is our elder brother, and we are the younger. This is not only an expression of courtesy, we have got ample proof of that statement in history. Indians did not covet anything from China. They gave us the sadhana, and I translate contemplation, meditation, and focus, of freedom, and maitri, friendship. Rabindranath has come to us from the country of our elder brother, unquote. Tagore responded to these words by saying that India felt I quote, a very great kinship with China, unquote. Shraddha, as he called it. Shraddha is a Sanskrit word, and I may roughly translate it as, as mutual respect and mutual kinship. These should be our beacons as we navigate the darkness of today. More than deterrence, a favored word in geopolitics, we all know that, the world needs resilience and the durability of the human spirit that has helped us withstand crises of different magnitudes through the ages. The road is long, dear friends, but let not the smallness and minutiae of the present deter us. Thank you so much, and be safe, be healthy, be well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador Rao, for your very comprehensive and uh, also very uh, uh, stimulating uh, speech. And uh, you mentioned uh, India Lobo Lore Tiger and also uh, Chinese uh, uh, scholar Liang, uh, uh, Liang Qi. So, so I think, you know, both uh, share the wisdom, as you said, the uh, Indian China brothers. Uh, so, so I think that, uh, you know, we have many uh, a uh, way to look at this relation, and particularly the, at the contemporary world, it's really uh, more important uh, that uh, India and China uh, get along and get together. So, uh, so uh, uh, once again, I, I thank you for your very thoughtful speech, and uh, uh, we, will, we will digest and we will, we will let people in China know. Uh, so now I would like to pass the chair to uh, uh, Toby, uh, to my friend Toby Simon. Uh, perhaps you can uh, chair the second half of the uh, opening uh, of our uh, conference. Thank you very much, uh, Liang Hyo, uh, His Excellency Ambassador Sun Yuxi, His Excellency Ambassador, Ambassador Mrs. Nirupama Rao, uh, and my dear friend Lawrence Brum. Uh, a couple of, I think a year back, uh, we all had uh, together with Ambassador uh, Mrs. Rao, we had the opportunity to visit uh, CCG, and that is when uh, we spoke about the idea of the Himalayan consensus. Uh, it was basically to ensure that we, are to we have many topics that have common interest, and we felt that one of the best ways to further a relationship is to look at these commonalities as we are neighbors, and we have been neighbors for the last 2,000 or 10,000 years. And we felt this is extremely important uh, uh, that we build uh, corporations where it was possible and uh, to see that there is a civilizational uh, reconnect between us, which probably would have been strained in the last few years. Uh, without uh, taking more time, let me introduce Ambassador Sun Yuxi. We are so honored and delighted to have him with us today. 
Ambassador Sun Yuxi was the ambassador of the People's Republic of China to Afghanistan, India, Italy, Poland. He was the spokesman of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of the People's Republic of China and the deputy director of its information department. Ambassador Sun is the former president of the China-Poland Friendship Association. As a career diplomat, he has worked in more than six, headed more than 60 delegations uh, of uh, government leaders to more than 138 countries. He was a member of the Chinese delegation to many international forums, including the UN General Assembly, the G20 Summit, APEC, the Asia European Summit, ASEAN Regional Forum, SCO, and a number of other such forums. Uh, without much ado, let me invite Ambassador Sun Yuxi to, to share his insights to this multicultural, multi country audience. Welcome, Ambassador Sun Yuxi. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm so glad to be here uh, to see some of the old friends here. And uh, first of all, I would like to give congratulations to Ambassador Rao. You, you have made a very good speech. I nearly entirely agree with you with what you said on developing China-Indian relations. And I also greatly appreciate the invitation by the organizers of this forum to talk uh, cooperation between China and India on fighting against the COVID-19 pandemic. I was Chinese ambassador from 2005 to 2008. My three years in India left me deeply in, the, in love with the land and the people. And during the tenure of my office, China and India established a strategic cooperative uh, partnership for peace and prosperity. Since then, uh, uh, I think our two peoples have uh, enjoyed uh, deeper exchange and uh, cooperation, and our two governments uh, coordinated more on major international and uh, regional affairs. Now, COVID-19 outbreak is posing a severe challenge to the mankind, uh, while global efforts have come to a crucial point. I think solidarity and cooperation are the most powerful weapons to fight against it. Uh, warriors respect no borders, uh, and the epidemics do not distinguish between races. They are common enemy of the mankind. Uh, we are now in the same boat. Uh, while the global efforts have come to a critical point, solidarity and cooperation are the most powerful weapon. So today I would like to focus my attention mainly on international cooperation to find this uh, COVID-19. Uh, and only by working together can we win this battle. Uh, China have taken its responsibility and provided support to the international community. Uh, we have worked closely with the international and the regional organizations, especially WHO. Uh, we have sent many medical teams to other countries and provided a huge amount of medical supplies. Uh, what we have done is based on the belief of building a community of shared future for mankind. China and India are both Asian civilizations with the populations accounting for more than one third of the world. So I think that we, uh, we have all the reasons to strengthen cooperation. I think that we can set up a good example for international cooperation. So far, China and India uh, maintained close communication and cooperation on academic, 
prevention and the control. Our leaders uh, of two countries have exchanged the messages and the telephone calls. Uh, we both believe in strengthening international cooperation. And this reminds me of the touching story of Dr. Kottnes, who went all the way uh, to China during the Second World War to support the war of resistance against the Japanese aggression in China. And he sacrificed his life in China. We should carry forward his spirit of internationalism and cooperate uh, with this spirit in fighting against the epidemic. I have noticed that at a critical moment of China's epidemic fight, the Indian government has uh, provided medical supplies to China. Uh, and the Indian people have shown their support in various ways. Uh, all these valuable support and as assistance will be greatly appreciated and that be long remembered. And since the outbreak of COVID-19 in Ind India, we in China have shared the same feeling and ex also extended a helping hand. Uh, China has timely uh, shared its experiences with the Indian side in epidemic preventing control and the treatment. Uh, many Chinese provinces and cities have donated medical materials and many Chinese uh, enterprises and the charities such as uh, have for assisted India with a large number of medical supplies, <coughs> such as facial masks, uh, protective suits, uh, medical gloves, and ventilators. I'm sure that China will continue to support and ass assist India, uh, strengthen medical and health uh, cooperation, and uh, jointly work with India to overcome the difficulties. However, in crises like this, I feel very sorry to hear some complaining, finger pointing, or scapegoating uh, from certain leaders or even politicians. Uh, such move will very likely divide the international community, lead to prejudice against the specific ethnic groups and ultimately hurt the shared interests of the world. Uh, at present, I have learned that the Indian government has taken a series of decisive and strict prevention and control measures, which delivered positive results. India's victory in epidemic control is of great significance to the global fight against the COVID-19. As a friend, I sincerely wish India an early victory. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much again, Ambassador. It was such a, uh, a wonderful sharing of thoughts. And let me now introduce the moderator for the first session, uh, TM Veeraragavan. Veeraragavan was the former resident editor of The Hindu. Uh, he was the editor of CNN and TV9. So he's a, he combines journalism well with televisions. And uh, let me invite him to take over and, and continue with the panel. Thank you very much, uh, Toby. Uh, it, was, uh, it was fascinating to listen to both uh, Ambassador Nirupama Rao as well as Ambassador Seep. It was fantastic to, to hear this exchange uh, of words. And I, and I hope to take this forward in the next uh, uh, in the session that we're going to begin right now, which has some experts to maybe decipher and try and understand the realities of this cooperation that we are talking about. Uh, that that both uh, both both our distinguished diplomats had put out as as the need of the hour, uh, not to be myopic, but see things from a larger strategic point of view. Uh, uh, of course, my panel, uh, as uh, most of you may be aware, Lawrence Bram, uh, who is uh, uh, who, who my friend Toby Simon tells me is a karate kid, uh, one of the twenty 
uh, uh, one of the uh, one of the twenty most sought or, or, or most recognized foreign experts in karate, but also someone who's very well versed with India-China relations. Someone who knows the nitty gritties and the intrigues of it. We have uh, Dr. Y. E. Baxin, who is from Wuhan, who joins us from Wuhan, who is uh, uh, you know at the epicenter of the entire crisis, and we would like to learn from you what uh, what you've learned out of the last four or five months of, of, of these tumultuous times. And of course, uh, Wang Feng, fellow journalist, uh, editor of Financial Times, uh, Chinese joining us as well uh, uh, to, to discuss the, uh, the, the, uh, the, the pandemic and what we've learned from it, as well as to try and understand more specifically on the India-China relations from an Asia point of view as well. Uh, my first question, and before I can get into more of the, uh, the geopolitical importance would be to you, Dr. Vaccine, considering that you have been uh, there at the epicenter of it, may I ask you both from your personal experience and uh, from a larger systemic response, what you believe were the three fundamental things that you got right, and also possibly the three fundamental things that maybe you got wrong, because we tend to learn more from our mistakes than from what we've got right. So, what would your advice be, and 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 if you could enlist that to us in your opening remarks? Hello. Okay, and um, good afternoon, everyone, and the center, um, CGG organization, to give me this opportunity to share my um, thinking. I'm a medical doctor from Renmin Hospital and of Wuhan University. My name is Bai Xinye. During the outbreak of COVID-19, I am always keeping an eye on the epidemic situation of COVID-19 in Wuhan. I would like to try my best to help more people in other countries in combating COVID-19. Today, I'm very glad to share my opinions. And uh, I hope Wuhan is ready to combat COVID-19, also benefit more countries and save more lives of the people around the world. And I think the key factors are very important for success. First, the highly effective social management and disease action plays a critical role in the limitation of virus spread. For example, under um, 23rd January, the lockdown of Wuhan City has stopped the virus spread. For example, and uh, this um, decisive action saved thousands of lives and created an elevated shortage of medical resources. I think these are the right things and these are very important things. And uh, the second thing is I think that uh, Wuhan made an important, Wuhan doctors made an important contribution in fighting and controlling COVID-19 and they did an extremely good job in treating COVID-19 patients. Facing this terrible virus, Wuhan doctors have worked out very good procedures for patient management. It's very important because it can save their medical resource, thus avoiding the infection of many doctors. Additionally, Wuhan doctors have put together in tough times and has been highly responsible for saving severe and critical patients. For example, to save the lives of an old man, the doctors in Renmin Hospital of Wuhan University applied lung transplantation therapy and saved their, his life. Therefore, at the late stage of COVID-19 outbreak in Wuhan, the mortality is extremely low. And the third order, Wuhan people take their own responsibility during the COVID-19 outbreak. Everyone knows how to do benefit their virus control and spontaneously take effective actions such as wearing facial masks, keeping social distance, staying home, and avoiding meetings. Additionally, the volunteers in Wuhan City have done a good job. For example, they provided their a free transportation for deliver the medical materials to hospitals. Most of the volunteers are young people and they played a critical role in their battle. And the last, I think, the highly effective 
the scientific technology takes a critical role in combating COVID-19 spread, especially, and the online technology plays a critical role. For example, the app, which had greatly supports the real-time communication between all peoples. And uh, this technology provides powerful functions. It helps the doctors, help the workers to communicate very easily and to reduce their frequency of infection. I think this is very important for advanced technology of China. In conclusion, and I have to, I think three key things are very important for success of Wuhan in combating COVID-19. The first thing is lockdown of the city and to reduce the number of infected patients. And the second thing, I think under the free diagnosis, under free diagnosis and free um, treatment, and, if, and it's to cost is free for anyone who should be receive medical intervention. And this measure was timely and decisive, right? And it can reduce the number of community, com community virus spread. That's very important. I also think another, um, the third scenes of thousands of health professionals from other cities came to Wuhan and provided enough medical support for treating severe and critical patients, especially the shortage of medical resources and early stage of COVID-19 outbreak. Three tens of health of Wuhan doctors. And Wuhan medical resource is very limited and no enough doctors, no enough nurses. But their big support from other cities is very important for the maintenance of human, of Wuhan hospital system and staying home and saving much more lives. Certainly, and facing COVID-19 outbreak, and any government and cities we are confronted with very serious problems. Wuhan also faced many challenges. But finally, Wuhan overcome the big public health crisis. I think the performance of Wuhan is perfect. However, we also have some lessons that may be meaningful for other countries like the India, right? And for example, and the first lesson, I think is at the early stage of COVID-19 outbreak, the suspected cases and the mild confirmed cases were suggested to stay home and keep social quarantine. Yeah. But virus spread was occurred in the family and in community. And the number of confirmed cases did increase greatly. Mm -hmm. It was a terrible situation. And to solve this problem, according to expert suggestions, and Wuhan established many cabin hospitals as late for the potential virus infected people. And thus, as late in the order potential virus, virus infected people can greatly cut off the transmission chain. Very important. I think the second lesson is that at early stage, some not very many people who should stay home went out for shopping and doing other things. And they are going out, increase the risk of infection and spreading the virus to other cases. At that time, and the number of confirmed cases still increased. And then Wuhan enhanced their community management, for example, prohibiting their citizens to go out. And at the same time, appearing most of the government members to serve the people staying home. This made sure effectively reduce the risk, reduce the frequency of going out, and also downregulate the prohibibility of infection. Therefore, I think keeping staying home is very important for everyone, especially at the early stage. And the third lesson, I think that in a few days ago, some confirmed cases were found in Sanmin community in Wuhan. Additionally, there are asymptomatic infection, infected cases can also be screened more often. Mm. And these cases made us very nervous. 
and to yeah. solve this problem, the project of testing nucleic acid and antibody for all the 11 million Wuhan citizens in only 10 days is started and ongoing. This is a huge project and we cost much money, but I think it's very, very valuable thing. Mm -hmm. And those are symptomatic virus carriers will be screened and isolated as early as possible. I think this measure will lower the risk of the repeated outbreak. If we do it this as early as possible, I think the result will become much better. But it's never too late, I think. Okay, and uh, I think and our, our sharing from the Wuhan experience can help uh, all, all the country around the world, especially, and to better and benefit the relationship of China and India, right? I think and, uh, in the future and uh, the world, we, uh, we win the battle for combating COVID-19. I think and the human, humanity can cooperate together and to solve this public health crisis. I think the future will be better. Thank you. TM, please mute, unmute yourself. Right. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, I, 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 I'm, I'm glad uh, there, were, there seems to have been some internet problems. So you, your audio was a little chiseled and broken when it came across to me. I'm also able to see Dr. Samrata, uh, Samrata Shetty, Chief Operating Officer of the Sinajaya Foundation as well. I couldn't see her earlier. So she's part of the panel as well. Welcome, Samrata, uh, as well for the panel. Uh, thank you so much. You outlined for us what you really learned. And uh, if I may just recap, because of the fact that we couldn't hear very clearly, you thought that the first three major points. One was the lockdown. Second was free treatment that was ensured across to people uh, across Wuhan. And the third was the focus of medical support that you received from all over China into Wuhan in that first few days that really helped you combat the, uh, the, the, the pandemic and sort of contain it. These were crucial aspects from what I gathered from what you said. And also, you said that the key focus would be about early stage detection, detection as we go along and making sure that uh, medication and social distancing is put in early and not at a delayed stage, even if it is a suspected case of social, uh, you know, uh, of the virus to go ahead and go with social quarantine as the world goes ahead and deals with this pandemic. That's pretty much uh, from the medical point of view. Thank you very much for that uh, perspective. I want to now focus because there are two big lessons that one learns from this pandemic. One is the medical aspect of it and how to deal with the medical aspect of it. And I think we leave that mainly to the doctors to discuss and decide on how to come about it. But the other is the economic and the administrative aspect of it as well. And the larger kind of cooperation that one discusses between countries. And I want to bring Wang Feng and Lawrence Braham into it. I want to start by asking you, Lawrence Braham, countries and nations often deal with each other, especially in some contexts in, you know, within Asia as well, with a sense uh, only a measured level of trust in sharing of information and understanding. Uh, there is always a sense of uh, worry and wariness about information that's shared internationally in several cases. Moving forward from this pandemic, are we seeing a situation which helps uh, to build more trust, to greater sharing and communication? And if we are heading towards that, what would that entail in terms of not just uh, a medical sharing of information, but uh, more, more geopolitical and strategic sharing of information on how to deal with a situation that is evolving in one country and making sure it doesn't affect another? Lawrence. Let me begin by, first of all, commending Wuhan and the Chinese leadership for taking very decisive and quick action on the outbreak of the coronavirus. I think a lot of what's been spun in the Western media is distorted and unfair. Uh, in the initial stages, I remember up until Chinese New Year, we didn't understand what was happening. We all thought it was another, a small outbreak of SARS because people didn't 
actually grasp that this was a, a, a new creature out there, this, this coronavirus. Once the gravity and danger and threat of this became clear, very decisive action was taken, first to cordon off Wuhan, then to cordon off Hubei province, in the interest not only of this spreading throughout China, but to limit its spread to the rest of the world. And then huge resources were thrown at the front line and there was an enormous amount of collaborative cooperation among everyone to self-quarantine. And I think that a very core principle here was that every life counts, everyone is important. And I think that's something that when you're talking today about collaboration between China and India on technology, on medical, those are technical issues, but I think on a cultural level, both countries share, as Ambassador Rao explained so clearly from the historical cultural context, a view about the interconnectivity of everything and the importance of all life. And um, there was you know, people who are in their 90s who were being saved. I think this is a very different approach than what's been taken in some Western countries where it's been almost a discriminatory policies, uh, let the old in some countries die uh, or don't even treat them or treat the rich or those who have accessibility. And um, it's a very, been a very different approach. The second thing is right after China was able to get control over the coronavirus and it still hadn't ended it, it had just finally learned enough to be able to control. And I think from what we learned was quarantine, isolation. I mean, if we think, I'll just back up on this, um, Dr. Ye can correct me if I'm, I'm wrong, but if we think that like human beings are bacteria and we are eating the resources of the planet, one day we self-destruct because there's no planet unless we can go to Mars like Elon Musk says. And effectively it's the isolation where the host, we people are the planet of the coronavirus. If we keep a distance, that virus eventually cannot jump to its next host or its next planet. And that seems to be so far the key thing that works. And so this knowledge, as well as the use of tracking systems, as well as the use of Chinese medicine, very traditional medicines that have been around for hundreds if not thousands of years, have been used and were proved to be very effective in the early stages. And I think early identification, uh, as Dr. Ye said, anybody could get tested, anyone could get free testing and get accessibility to at least the knowledge of whether they were a carrier or not, whether they had it. And if they knew at the early stages, it could be cured. And I think that this knowledge was immediately transported to Italy and other countries that needed it when they requested it. And China sent teams in, as, as Ambassador Swin explained, you know, it was the first to go in and share whatever knowledge it had. And at, at this point, um, as the virus spread to other countries, the accumulated knowledge, it was really not about theory or science, it was just about experience. It was entirely experiential. And at that point, China was the first willing to share that knowledge and to spread its own experience and see how it could be adopted to other countries. So I think this is an example of, of what can and should be done. And we need more of this interchange and more of the sharing. I think what's unfortunate is for, um, as Ambassador Swen pointed out, for political reasons, the coronavirus has become politicized in certain Western countries and is used now as a political issue. And this is not helping anyone. And this is not helping the broader fight of us as humanity together to combat this virus. No, that's very interesting that you make that point. May I just ask a question for you to elaborate on uh, whether you believe that this pandemic would set the platform where we tend to see each other with a little more respect rather than looking up to the West and European models of science for solving problems out here. Uh, when you say that there was a lot of uh, 
uh, uh, you know, when you, when, you, when you point out to the use of traditional medicine, to the use of traditional practices in terms of dealing with the crisis, would you believe that slowly we would, we would emerge, uh, perhaps looking to each other for solutions rather than looking outwards? When I'm, and I'm talking in terms of uh, the Asian, uh, uh, Asian group. I'm talking about China, India, Southeast Asia, and countries within, which may have their own solutions to a crisis or pandemic situations. I think if we look at a cultural context, you know, in America, there's been a lot of resistance to self-quarantine. There's been a lot of focus on the immediate need to bring back the economy or to bring back the interest of business. I think we have to look at the cultural context of what was driving the ability of uh, China, in uh, Korea, Japan, other parts of Asia, uh, and I believe this is completely shared in South Asia as well and Southeast Asia, is these cultural influences. So let's just, if we wanted to break it down, in the shared Buddhism, Hinduism of China and India, you have a cultural context that on a science level or quantum physics level is that everything's interconnected. We're all interconnected. Every life is important. I think that is a very important starting point, not just those who are rich or those who can contribute to the economy in a certain way are important and to make these godlike decisions of who should live and who should die. This is not the context at all. The second is that there's also a system in place of people being able to say, okay, if we've made a judgment, we're going to do this, we consolidate and we all work together. And in China, that's very much a Confucian uh, thinking process. India has its own cultural context for that. It is also shared. And then in the perspective of change, I think in, in Taoist approaches to things, everything is always changing. There's nothing that's not changing. And so the fact that people are suddenly told our lifestyle has to change to, to, to be reconstructed to address this virus, to address survival of all of us, is something that allowed for very quick adaptation to change. So I think these cultural influences allowed for a very quick response. Um, not of course to mention the traditional Chinese medicine. In India, you have traditional medicine uh, and med medicinal systems that are very, very similar. In fact, across the Himalayas, the Tibetan medicine system, the Bhutanese medicine system, all adapt the same principles. A lot of that is preventive medicine, and a lot of that is looking at the total context of one's health and mental outlook as a collective set of factors, not just trying to address a single aspect of sickness or disease in isolation. And I think what we found with coronavirus is immune system strength was key to resilience and resistance. And that is really looking at the total context. I, I also wanna say that there's also a shared cultural value, which I think is going to bring together at least the countries of Asia around this, if not the world at some point, but there's a shared story we often talked about in our Himalayan consensus meetings in the past, and that's the sort of story of Shambhala, which is shared both by China and India and across the region. And it's really saying, you know, that in this time we're living in now, short-sighted greed, anger, and ignorance have created um, environmental disasters, health crises like we're facing right now, pandemics that can't be cured, and of course, wars and, and crises like this. And all of this is being driven by short-sighted interest and greed. And as soon as we start to look at a kind of shared common destiny, we are all in this together and start to think in a broader context. As Ambassador Rao said, investment in healthcare, pharmaceuticals, in you know, really universal healthcare, investment in the technologies around that, the technologies for environment, the technologies for enormous shift from fossil fuels to renewables would be a positive yeah. application of technology. Right now, technology is being misused. It's not being applied in a positive way. It's being applied to create a lot of social division, a lot of anger, a lot of hatred, basically for stock prices. 
Uh, that's right. That's very well put. In fact, the last uh, last line had the sting in the tail uh, on 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 how how we've designed our economy and our systems. Uh, given that this is a reality that we contend with, Wang Feng, I want to pose this question to you: uh, How do we how do you see us developing a sense of trust with each other? How do you see us going forward on the road? Uh, do you see this fundamentally making us stop and reap we've done things so far? Or would you believe that we're still not that far as yet? The roadmap for potentially building trust with each other, how do we work that out? Right, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I was actually just uh, sending out a tweet uh, saying I'm uh, so honored to be on the same panel as these uh, distinguished guests, but in particular, Dr. Ye. I don't think uh, many people here understand what a great job he has done. He is responsible for building WeChat groups for thousands of frontline doctors from around the world, from some of the hardest hit countries, to share click, clinical knowledge about how to save people. Uh, I don't know directly how many lives he is responsible of saving, but I think it's a very disappointing story that his story is not told more widely in the world. So that's where I start. I think to build trust and to share more knowledge for the future, uh, we can't always count on our national governments, especially during this crisis. Mm -hmm. Some well-meaning senior officials or world leaders uh, could do their part, but you may not get the reciprocal reaction from the other side. So national governments could fail, I mean, for a crisis like this, but we can always count on the professionals, the doctors, the nurses, the think tank experts from the around the world through their direct peer-to-peer -peer channels of information exchange and knowledge sharing to come up with instant time-saving solutions and uh, plans. I think that that's a very good start. This story is not widely told enough. I'm sure there are thousands of doctors and experts from around the world at this moment doing the same thing as Dr. Ye, but their stories are not widely told. I think partly my industry should be responsible for that. We're not telling enough of these stories. And that's my second point. For example, between China and India, I was amazed how much reliable information there is in China about what's happening in India. There is a lot of misinformation. For example, earlier on uh, from Chinese media, from some of the most popular WeChat uh, news channels, we read about what a, a ticking time bomb India could be, especially uh, the uh, Dharavi district in Mumbai. There, there's mm -hmm. so much sensationalist reporting in China about uh, uh, what a danger that is, uh, that uh, uh, district in Mumbai. But so far, um, from all reliable channels, we could see it's not as bad not half as bad as what was reported in China in, in the first place. So that's another problem these days. I think um, in China, there's also a lot of concern from the public, from the news industry, about unreliable reporting on what's happening in China, not just in uh, um, Indian news uh, media, but also throughout the world. Uh, I think uh, 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 Lawrence's point about, you know, um, there's a lot of uh, mistrust in China about international media. Uh, well, there, there's certainly a lot of misunderstanding, but uh, I think the blame could, go, could certainly go both ways. So uh, the media haven't been doing exactly a very good job either. I have to admit that. Uh, but again, let the, pro let the professionals do what professionals do. Uh, I think uh, laterally, there's so much work to be done uh, between organizations separate from government-led efforts about uh, promoting cooperation and mutual understanding between the professions. But the professionals themselves could do so much more. I mean, if you ask who in China these days are the most authoritative experts on India, these are not think tank experts, not university professors. Uh, my answer would be these are the marketing executives from companies like Lenovo, Oppo, Vivo, uh, Xiaomi. These are the real frontline people. Chinese people working in India for 20 years, been to places you, could, you couldn't, you don't even know yourselves probably. 
these are the people actually making the most progress in promoting exchange through business, through commerce. Their roles have not been properly recognized in both countries anywhere, actually. And their contribution, even the work they have done directly on COVID uh, uh, re relief, both ways, when the, the, when the disease first started, these people were sourcing medical supplies to go into China. And when it spread throughout the rest of the world, they were doing so much more to uh, uh, ship PPE from China to India. Very, very few media outlets reported on what they did. Again, that's another disappointment. So uh, as I said, I think we should leave the professionals to do what professionals do. Uh, governments, the best governments could do is to facilitate and basically get out of their way. Yeah, thanks a lot. That's, that's very interesting that you put that point across that, that let professionals do their jobs, let governments keep out of their way in terms of interactions and let's not let our misinformation and our biases uh, affect our response to a pandemic. I want to ask you a very quick question, uh, uh, you know, a, 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 an add-on question to what you have uh, uh, mentioned. You see, one of the big problems that one may, one may look at is, is because there has been a sense that has been fed in Indian population that China is a threat. And, and there is a sense that there is a China-US race that's on and China is closing the gap with the United States and would like to be a world leader. How India sees that as well. How do you see China going about this process uh, as we go along? Uh, you know, in the, uh, you know, as we go along, do you see it making a more conciliatory effort, taking a more conciliatory effort to develop this and, and bridge over the language divide that we may have? Yes, um, from a strategic point of view, I think China, um, the Chinese government has been relatively uh, conciliatory in its dealings with India through this uh, crisis. I mean, uh, uh, there are plenty of good, goodwill gestures, uh, but also on the few thorny issues such as, uh, uh, um, you know, sub-quality PPE from China to India, and also the recent standoff in Sikkim. Uh, China, the, the Chinese government's response, at least from my point of view, has been relatively low-key. Uh, it doesn't really want these issues to disrupt the good work that's being done, the goodwill that is being built. So this is a very good strategic opportunity for both countries, actually. There's no denying the split between China and US only getting worse. Uh, this is a strategic opportunity for India, absolutely. I think that there's been plenty of uh, such analyses from Indian media these days, from Indian experts. But on China's point of view, I think China should also realize this is an opportunity to uh, improve relations. Uh, and there's such a huge pragmatical need anyway from Chinese point of view. Right. Thank you so much. I just want to get quickly a word from uh, Samrata Shetty. Uh, you've been hearing what they've said from across, uh, from in China. You've heard the, uh, heard the sense of a need for cooperation. Do you see a pan-Asia front developing? Do you see countries learning from each other? What's, what's the sense that you're getting as you interact with people? Uh, is there a sense of wanting to look outward and look into how the other is dealing with? Or is there a, a myopic sense of looking uh, only uh, at, your, at your own issues and not and shutting out uh, information that's coming from outside? Right. Thank you, Vera, for the question. I feel having a gold standard for each country is too far-sighted at this point of time. Because if you take an example of India as a country, each state is responding differently to the spread of virus. Predominantly, I feel there could be five factors. First one is leadership. It's extremely important to have good leader at this point of crisis. Leadership must diffuse trust in larger community. It is only when trust is achieved, contract tracing, aggressive testing, building thousands of shelters become effective, basically because of social trust and cohesiveness. Now, when I say cohesiveness, it's with different cultural background, economic background, and different ideologies. Now, my second point is the role of nursing and primary health care, where people who feel sick do not hesitate to see a doctor. We must build trust in the lowest community level. Perhaps the reason why there is no death in some states uh, in India, especially Kerala, even though Kerala was the first state in India to report a COVID case late in January, the number of cases have dropped significantly with only four deaths till date, which is much better than the rest of the states in India. My third point would be population density. 
Now, we cannot standardize in each country because each diff uh, country has a different population density. For example, in India itself, states like Maharashtra and Karnataka, we see the difference in the spread of virus. Even in states like Karnataka, each district like Bangalore, Udupi, Gulbarga, each has a different infection rate. So uh, same strategy again won't work in this case. Now, uh, another point that would be countries should spend more on healthcare. Healthcare should be considered, should not be considered as a cost. We should mm. ensure healthcare at the bottom level. But R&D should be considered in a global domain. Now, I feel mm. we should invest more on this as pandemics are here to stay. Now, these viruses need no visa, no boundaries, more like we're fighting a war. It's time for us to ramp up our India's public healthcare expenditure. This can drive growth and prepare for the next pandemic. And my last point would be digitalization. Now, it is also another reason why we can't have a gold standard for every Asian country, because countries like China and India have better digital access to the citizen. And we, can, we still have an option of uh, restarting our economy, be it through e-commerce or work from home, when compared to other countries like Bangladesh and other Asian countries. So uh, basically, to sum it up all, lessons learned through this COVID pandemic is that we need great leadership with uh, social trust and cohesiveness. Countries need to spend more on public health care and build trust at the lowest community level. We should have global collaborative R&D. Private and public uh, sector should work hand in hand. For example, a TVS company in um, India, which is an automobile group, is now making a ventilator to help fight COVID. Now, similarly, in China, Volkswagen has helped in making a mask. So I feel the public and the private uh, sector going forward should work together. And last but not the least, human uh, should live in harmony with Mother Nature. So we should all be prepared for the worst and hope for the best. Right. Thank uh, thanks so much, Samrata. In fact, uh, uh, like Ambassador Nirupama Rao pointed out, it's an anthropological threat that we are facing right now. And there is a need to it. I just want one quick answer from all the panelists, uh, a quick yes or no. As we go forward, do you see uh, the platform and the bridge between India and China? And I'm specifically asking India and China evolving into something that is far stronger in terms of information exchange? Or do you feel that we're still going to have a tentative road ahead that's, that's something that we've got to tread each pandemic at a time. Starting with Lawrence Graham, quick responses before I hand over to the next moderator, Randy Mock, who's already there. I think between uh, China and India, areas of technology, healthcare, uh, even finance are gonna start to integrate more and more. This has to be an outcome of this. And I can only see the two countries working closer together in the future uh, as a result of this. Wang? Um, I think this is a great opportunity. Let's not waste it. Uh, I am uh, optimistic, but I think a lot of work needs to be done right now. Right. And Dr. Baxson, I just want one last bit of advice to Indian doctors uh, from Wuhan. One quick bit of advice that if you would like to share. You need to unmute, sir. Okay. Yeah, okay. Hello? Yes, sir. Go okay. Ahead. And I can uh, introduce my personal experience and uh, about my, um, my, my chat room and for sharing the experience of medical. Mm -hmm. That's very important and to and, uh, share the experience for global doctors, right? And uh, during, this, during this process of setting up this platform, for global uh, doctors sharing experience, I found that Wuhan doctors have very good experience, very good knowledge right. to combat this, combat this COVID-19 COVID disease, right? And also, and the Wuhan doctors experience a very tough process, a very tough course, and then succeed. And uh, most of the Wuhan doctors are very confident and to, to combat this virus. So, and sharing this experience and also sharing the confidence to other countries, right? Especially and for the Indian. And if we can set up a bridge for communication with Indian doctor and the Indian health professionals and the Indian people, and I can, and we can use this platform and we chat, we chat, uh, we chat room and to send, to transmit 
Wuhan doctor's knowledge, experience, and confidence to, to India and to other countries. I think it's a perfect process to help other countries. Thank you. Right. Thank you so much. And congratulations for your effort at Wuhan. We do hope to learn more from you as you would learn from us as well. And the first thing I'm going to do is to buy a Mandarin to English translation dictionary so that I get to learn more of what's happening in China and make sure that misinformation like Wang Feng is pointing out is not spread over in both sides of the border. Thank you so much all for this uh, lovely discussion as Ambassador Nirupama Rao and Ambassador Su Yuxi pointed out. I hope our civilizational and cultural ties will tide us over myopic instances of looking inwards and only at, at the recent past and perhaps build a larger, more concrete bridge in terms of international and information sharing to fight pandemics. Thank you, Samrata Shetty, as well, for joining us. Uh, I'm handing over to our next panel moderator, Andy Mock, who's already there. It's over to you, Andy. Thank you, TM. So I have uh, some big footsteps to follow in. You did an incredible job of moderating that panel. So uh, to kick off this uh, event today, we heard from Ambassador Sun and Ambassador Rao, who gave us, I think, a very long-term, very insightful perspective. And then TM and the panelists uh, on his panel provided uh, very valuable practical insights on the actual impact and how uh, COVID-19 can be better treated, not just as a medical disease, but perhaps as an information disease as well. So now we're going to focus on a different aspect of this, and this is the business side. And in particular, we're going to be exploring the impact that COVID-19 has had on global supply chains and what changes they might bring post COVID-19. We all know that uh, global supply chains are not only the face, but also the backbone for globalization. And as a result of the measures taken to contain COVID-19, we've seen historic economic contractions uh, across the major economies uh, around the world. We've also seen lockdowns that have severely curtailed the movement of goods and people uh, around the world as well. But the longer term, perhaps more important uh, changes are structural as countries contemplate previously discounted risk and are engaging in new geopolitical calculations. So some of the questions that we're going to be exploring today in our panel uh, include, where should, we, where should our focus be if we want to better understand what changes will emerge uh, in global supply chains? Uh, what might a post-COVID-19 supply chain look like? How do technological advances such as AI and 5G intersect with these uh, potential changes in global supply chains? And how are decision makers in China and India thinking about these developments? And perhaps most importantly, what are they doing to position themselves to take advantage of these changes? Our first speaker today will be Kevin Kong, who is the chief economist for KPMG China, uh, who is also a PhD from the Wharton School in Philadelphia. So always happy to uh, encounter a fellow alum, did my, uh, my MBA at Wharton, uh, wasn't, didn't have the opportunity to do a PhD, but uh, very happy to uh, hand it off to Kevin, who will kick, us, kick off the discussion by helping us better understand exactly how supply chains are changing and what macro indicators uh, should we focus on to be better prepared for the changes that are coming. Kevin, uh, let me turn it over to you. Thank you, Andy. Uh, really, thank you for the introduction. And also, uh, I want to thank CCG and also Henry and for inviting me to be on the panel. Uh, I think it's a very important uh, discussion uh, I, have, I have actually been an audience for many CCG's uh, webinar in the past, uh, which I have benefited a lot. So thank you for giving me the opportunity to participate in this discussion. 
So before I discuss supply chain, I want to really talk about two issues first. The first one is uh, the pandemic. And also I want to talk about the Chinese economy. Then I will touch upon on the supply chain situation, uh, which you asked. So first thing about the pandemic. So even though I'm not an epidemiologist, I'm just an economist, I still want to share with you what we have found on the pandemic threat around the world. Uh, we have found that the pandemic really has uh, three uh, phases for the spread. Uh, in the first phase, phase one, the virus was first identified in China. So we saw the new cases quickly uh, rose in late January and early February. But as the Chinese government take very strict or even draconian actions, we saw the new cases quickly, uh, quickly uh, just uh, disappeared uh, as early as March. However, in phase two, uh, we saw many uh, developed countries like U US and Europe uh, saw very quick rapid rise in cases since early March. But by mid-April, uh, the, the spread in advanced countries, especially in Europe, has been gradually uh, moderating, so which is a very encouraging sign. However, in phase three, uh, especially since late March or early, uh, early April, the cases in developing countries are quickly rising. So really there are three uh, stages for the spread of the virus in the world. I think that the, three, the third uh, phase, the stage one, the uh, stage three is very concerning because many developing countries, they do not like, uh, they do not have enough medical resources to treat or identify the virus, which is very concerning. Uh, I think it's not only uh, important for those countries, but also important for the global economy. Uh, a good example is smallpox, right? So for smallpox to uh, eradicate smallpox in the world, not only we need about two countries to have the vaccine, we really need vaccine for the whole human being to get rid of it. So I think if we, uh, the developing country situation is not be de dealing properly, I think those countries can become a, a hiding place for the virus which may make it very difficult for us to uh, eradicate the virus from the world completely. So I think these are very concerning. Uh, uh, the second question about the Chinese economy. So as we said earlier, uh, China was the first country to be hit hard by the virus. But also uh, I think what we are seeing in China can be a good lesson for many other countries. Uh, because when we talk to our clients overseas, uh, many uh, countries in other, part of, uh, in other part of the world uh, really want to know what's happening in China to get a good license to see how the economy is evolving and how the economy is recovering after the pandemic. So we just got the China's April data this uh, morning. So if you look at the, the news, you see uh, China just released the April uh, economic data this morning. I think uh, as we have been anticipating, we are seeing continuous recovery in Chinese economy. Uh, so for, for example, many uh, indicators show a very good re rebound. For industrial production, we are even seeing a positive year-over-year -year growth in April. So I know some people may be kind of a little bit uh, skeptical about the government release of uh, official data, but when we look at specific product markets, like for auto sales was up 4% in April, uh, ice excavator sales, uh, construction machine was up 60% in April, and the cell phone was also showing about 10% growth uh, last month. So I think not only for the economic data, but also for many uh, specific markets, we are seeing very good uh, recovery in the Chinese economy. Uh, so finally, going back to your earlier question about supply chain, so I think it's a very important question. So when we look at uh, global supply chain in the world, there are really three major regions. Uh, in North America, US is the, 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 the hub for North America. Uh, US has been a key supply hub and also a demand hub for North America and also for Latin America. For Europe, the second important region, Germany is the, at the center of the supply chain and also demand for Europe supply chain network. Uh, in Asia Pacific, in Asia as a whole, Japan used to be the, the major uh, driver or at the center of the hub in Asia, in Asia, but China is rapidly replacing Japan to be the key driver for Asia. I think without, uh, with or without the, the COVID-19 virus, uh, we believe Asia will be the fastest re uh, growing region in the world. So I think uh, for Asia, we definitely need to strengthen the collaboration within the region. Uh, we saw very interesting pattern already happening in China. In the first quarter, uh, ASEAN country uh, replaced Japan and the EU or US to become the largest trading partner for China. I think it's a very important trend because in the past, 
either US, Europe, or uh, Japan, uh, they were uh, China's largest trading partner, but we are seeing uh, some fundamental change uh, this year. I think same thing for India. There are definitely a lot of collaboration between China and India uh, in the future. I think both countries have a very good uh, complementary uh, to each other. Uh, India has a very strong uh, growing labor force and also has very good service sector. And China also has a very large market. So I think those two countries can definitely uh, doing more together to strengthen uh, the Asia uh, collaboration in the region. So I think that's what I uh, want to share. Thank you, Andy. Great, thank you very much, Kevin. I think that uh, providing that context of where China's economy is in terms of recovering uh, from COVID-19 uh, is very, very important because uh, supply chains, of course, take uh, occur within the context of broader uh, economic activity. Um, if I may, uh, Kevin, I'd like to ask, what's your outlook? And you also uh, touched on these three stages uh, of COVID-19. Um, I know there's a big concern as well in the U.S. and in China where there's a potential second wave. What are your thoughts around that and how might that affect the thinking of global corporations as they do uh, think about what sort of changes they might want to make uh, to their supply chains? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's a very important question, but uh, I think probably uh, epidemiologists will be more uh, better qualified than me to answer it. But when we look at historical patterns, uh, for example, in 1998, that, uh, that virus or pandemic, really the second wave has the biggest uh, fatality or has the biggest impact. Because in, 19, uh, 19, uh, in 1918, uh, the first wave happened in the spring of, of that year, uh, but in fall, the second wave caused more uh, fatality, more death, and more damage to the global, uh, to the human being in the world. So I think we do have to be very careful about the possible second wave of the virus, which uh, we never know. But I think as far as we see, uh, in China, uh, the, the new cases have been in single digits for the past almost two months. So I think the government is doing uh, many good things to control the second wave from happening. But again, I think it's still very uh, a key risk we have to watch. Uh, also, I think for uh, supply chain, uh, I think for China still has one, the, the largest and also fastly growing uh, consumer market in the world. Uh, I'll give you an example like Tesla. The reason why Tesla set up their factory or super factory in Shanghai last year, I think one of the key reasons that uh, uh, China has over half of global new energy vehicle sales last year. So definitely done to the largest markets. I think it would be a no brainer for Tesla to set up their factory uh, in China because that's the, uh, where they can sell the most cars here probably. So I think that's still a very important reason. But again, I think we have to both balance the risk of a second wave uh, virus from happening. And also I think the long-term horizon to look at the, where you want to put your money in. Great, thank you, Kevin. No, and I think that's a great point that with respect to supply chains, that uh, Asia is not just a source of raw materials and manufacturing capabilities, but also uh, a vast and increasingly affluent consumer market. And that weighs, uh, I think, takes a large part of the decision making uh, for many multinationals. So speaking of multinationals, Lenovo is one of the first Chinese companies to become a truly global company. And we have Gina Tiao, who is the uh, Senior Vice President for uh, the Chief Strategy Officer and Chief Marketing Officer uh, for Lenovo uh, with us today as well. Uh, Gina, could you please tell us uh, from a technology perspective, uh, how do you see technology affecting uh, supply chains going forward. Okay. Thank you, Andy. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. It's great to speak with all of you today. And for sure, the year of 2020 is full of uncertainty. Uh, public health crisis caused the supply issue because of a labor shortage and the travel restrictions. Uh, but uh, also as the virus spreads, half of the world is now under some sort of a stay home order and the consumption has dropped uh, significantly. Uh, COVID-19 has already significant impact to our business and the global in, uh, economy, especially with the strong supply uh, relying on manufacturing 
everything impact. And because also the movement of people and goods are impact, so it damage our business in the beginning. And so this is why I want to talk about how Lenovo manage the whole supply chain and then how to, uh, how to manage all the crisis. And then I also talk about the, the lesson learned and how technology can help. So Lenovo operates in 180 markets around the world. So we did face significant short-term constraints and the delays in both for consumption and the supply chain. And because all major smartphone factory is located in Wuhan, and all factory also in Shenzhen, Hefei, all are closed temporarily by the end of January and February. Uh, faced with such huge challenges, we leverage on power of manufacturing size around the world, adjust the capabilities and the rebalance production. And fortunately, we, Lenovo has 33 manufacturing sites around the world. And so this is why we can leverage global full points. And so this is then we can navigate and leverage the diversity of our market demand and the supply chain to mitigate the impact of pan pandemic. And in the early stage of coronavirus, the Lenovo's manufacturing in China was stopped of factories in India and the other sites continue to open, operate, supporting the company in meeting demand from all the markets in the world. And in India, we have two manufacturing sites. One is a PC manufacturing in Pondi, uh, we call the Pondi Cherry. Another is mobile phone manufacturing is in Chennai. And then in March, then we so that time we leverage Indian uh, manufacturing to supply to other countries. And then in March, then we had to shut our operation in India due to the national lockdown in India. Uh, the demand for PC, mobile phone, and smart devices in India remains strong, and which help accelerate the recovery of our capacity in China and other countries because in that time, all manufacturing in China started to open, so then they can pr provide the supply to India. So people uh, may know that Lenovo is number one in PC and the tablet in China, but they may not know Lenovo in, Ch in India, we are the number one in PC and the tablet. We have more than 30% market share in PC and more than 50% market share for uh, tablet in India. So this is why we can leverage two sides for supply and the demand and the ensure the continued manufacturing is so important and the quick rebuild of our capacity is even more important. So this is why we, how we work hard to rebuild the Wuhan, Hefei, Shenzhen manufacturing to pro provide the supply around the world. So this is why I think is a, this is a global operating uh, company can leverage global demand advantage and also leverage uh, the supply advantage globally. So this is how Lenovo manage that. This is why our business uh, in, in the beginning impacted, but in the end, it seems that we didn't impact enough. Uh, we didn't impact so much. So I, I want to talk about the second, why, what I, we learned about this, what's the lesson learned from the whole process, how we manage that. And because in the future, it's still hard to predict, even when we talk about the health area, it's still hard to predict what happened in the future. And, but uh, we believe it's never stopped. Is, so this is why the first lesson we should learn from the, this COVID-19, that means we always prepare the challenges. We always should act, act quickly. If we go in the, in the future, we always prepare. If some case happen in one country, the whole global should alert ourselves to take action as soon as possible because we have to prepare for the worst, for survival, and then through for the best. And the second lesson learned is a uh, urgent need for intelligent transformation. This is about the IT. We talk about the, all the smart technology, all the digital, how the digital and the IT can help that. Because recently, because of the labor shortage and the increased the, uh, digital consumption, 
So this is why we find the, the big data, 5G, uh, and cloud, everything increased the significantly. Even we got the report from the PwC study, nearly 75 of companies expect to have achieved the advanced level of digitalization within the next three years. So this is why the booming of IT requirement for industry, for all the companies. So this is why in the uh, April and in May, we have a supply shortage. And then we just produce the product every day and achieve the historical high manufacturing level, but we still cannot produce enough uh, can fit the uh, demanding. So this is why the whole demanding in the world from to b business and also from to c business. And because of to c business, the working at home, study at home, and uh, so to have a, a gaming at home. So this is why the, the those uh, changes, uh, the scenario changes, so require more PCs. So in the past, then maybe one PC for man, one family, but now one person needs a one PC. So this is why the whole demand of a PC, whole demand of a tablet increases significantly for both of the home side, but also in industry side. So this is why we believe the technology the smart technology can help that. So this is a lesson learned. I think uh, technology can help. And the, the third lesson is the uh, importance of uh, globalization because uh, Lenovo got the benefits of the globalization. So this is why we are the believer of global local because we source global and the deliver local and the, we leverage it, diversify the talent, diversify the people and the diversify customer and the, the partners to build the speed, the scale and the efficiency. This is, uh, uh, we, we think uh, in, in the future, if we want to build the, the good, uh, good economy, we have to work together. So the last one is talk about the future and the post pandemic world. I believe, so this is cannot be the first, but as a human, as all the country, we should work together because country, the, 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 the relationship will become between the countries, we should cooperate because we are facing the Corona-19, we face all the, uh, the, the, the disease Humans should work together. So this is why if I urge, I will ask the people to think how to work together and how to leverage technology and how people to cooperate together and to make a better work, a world and also serve a well-being of all human, human together. So Andy, this is my side. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Gina. And, you know, I think you are uh, sharing about Lenovo's business in India, I think certainly adds a lot of color and persuasiveness to Wang Feng's point that it's the corporations, I think, that really understand what's going on in places like India. The other thing that struck me in listening to your uh, comments and your analysis is that Lenovo is not only uh, a participant in the global supply chain, but also as a technology company, an enabler of the uh, global supply chain, because many companies, not just Lenovo, uh, rely on technology to make their supply chains more effective. Are there any particular technologies that you've seen uh, that are garnering especially more interest in the world of supply chains or logistics? Yes, I think uh, so. We believe the the new technology, the smart technology, will change the world. At Lenovo, we have a three S strategy. First three, first uh, uh, S is smart uh, IoT. It so means all the endpoint smart IoT PC tablet can catch up all the data. And the second is the smart infrastructure. It means all the big data all the data center, all the 5G infrastructure, and to do all the data uh, computing. And the third one is each vertical and the smart uh, solution. So this is why Lenovo provides all the 5G AI, big data, data center, and also vertical solutions. So this is why currently we provide all the solutions and the smart technology solutions to 
each industry. This is why in China we call the new infrastructure, Xinjijian. Yes. So I think Lenovo have all the building blocks can help all the, all the countries to, to surpass and to grow the economy for each industry. Mm. Certainly, and I think that mentioning this term new infrastructure, I think is a very important one and one I'm sure we'll be hearing more about uh, in the next week or so with the two sessions coming up. And this is, of course, an important national initiative, not just, I think, a corporate initiative for companies like Lenovo. But now uh, on the question of global companies, uh, companies with a global footprint, now let's hear from uh, an executive who represents another global company. Uh, this would be Gopi Hanuman Thapa, who is a managing director at Bison Krupp. And Gopi, um, perhaps you can start because we all know, or perhaps uh, we should know, that the challenges posed to global supply chains by COVID-19 include uh, companies thinking about do they want to diversify their supply chains uh, to include not just China. And India is seen as a very attractive alternative. Uh, could you perhaps share with us uh, what's going on in India and how it's looking as a additional place for global supply chains? Thank you, Andy. Uh, but before I start, uh, may I thank uh, Toby Simon and Synergy Foundation for giving me this opportunity to express my views. Uh, from an aerospace industry and aerospace manufacturing perspective, I think uh, what's happened uh, is uh, very, very significant. This uh, microscopic or organism has uh, changed the way we look at the world. Uh, just about two months ago, uh, we were sitting on a backlog uh, as an industry of about seven years of aircraft which were to be supplied to commercial aviation. And lo and behold, in uh, two months' time, we are now talking of a downturn, which is significant. Uh, we don't see demand coming back to this industry for at least another three years. Commercial aviation is off the uh, you know, uh, radar for a while. So what's really happening is uh, while we see and possibly an improved trend in the regional transportation where people would travel more within the region uh, and uh, this would possibly increase, uh, have some increased demand for some uh, single aisle aircraft, but for large international travel, which is twin aisle aircraft, we see definitely uh, a big challenge, not, not uh, until we find uh, solutions to uh, the, uh, the vaccine or whatever that is in place. I think people will, uh, behavior has modified. No one would really like to travel at the personal risk or be take the stress of being quarantined at two ends, 14 days when you go out put, and 14 days when you come back, that's close to about 28 days or 30 days just for a three day travel. Now, I think people will, Wait. So very clearly, international travel is off the radar for many companies, except in its very, very essential. Now, in all this, uh, what's really happened is uh, aerospace is, uh, uh, you know, already global in nature. Its supply chain is fairly distributed. Uh, you have uh, uh, in different parts of the world components being made, systems being made, assembled in various uh, in other parts of the world being tested. So it's already a global supply chain at work. So what's really happening is companies today are who already have installed capacity to meet the requirements for the next three to four years are today trying to really shed the baggage, really shed the baggage. Uh, this is like trying to turn the ship uh, in deep sea when you're in high seas, trying to turn and it's not easy. So it's, we are all going to go through a lot of pain and uh, very clearly uh, try and find uh, uh, solutions to manage this pain as I call it. There will be a cascading impact of this uh, to the service industry, which is connected into aviation, which is airports, which are uh, the hospitality, which is uh, the other, other end of the service sector of booking sol solutions, booking in other entire things. So I think there'll be a ramification of uh, this entire aspect of uh, this industry of aerospace and aviation. But having said this, I think what's also going to happen is, yes, like you said, uh, India could be a recipient of uh, our best cost country for some of uh, these opportunities uh, for uh, you know cost uh, when we have to go take this cost on route. But I think uh, 
business understands only one language, and that is clearly about business efficiencies and costs. So irrespective of the uh, political or security situations which go around the world, I think businesses will learn to manage this risk by hedging the political and security needs and find that way they will go to places where they need to do business. And that's not going to change. What are Indian companies really doing at this stage? I think uh, there's a huge amount to innovate, uh, to kind of meet this challenge. Uh, and this innovation is gonna take place uh, through a hell of a lot of uh, uh, automation and through uh, what I call it as uh, smart learning uh, to manage uh, uh, the, the downturn. Very clearly that's gonna happen. Uh, in many ways, uh, the B2B industry has to redefine itself uh, to, uh, you know, uh, to manage this pain. So in, uh, from a government perspective, we do find uh, some kind of stimulus coming uh, uh, the way of uh, encouragement uh, in terms of boosting liquidity. But however, uh, in terms of really spurring demand is something that which, uh, we will need to see. Uh, that's one part, but what's really happening is the global trend, what we find is uh, people are talking of cutting back on spending, you know, and, uh, and that's uh, something which is definitely going to be worrisome across the globe. Uh, there's redefinition of what is essential, what's essential in region A may not be essential in region B, so people will try and kind of uh, 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 redefine what the essential needs are. Uh, the B2B industry uh, will, uh, and industrial conglomerates will refocus their short-term and mid-term plans to being more essential rather than uh, you know, trying to do everything all the place. So I think that's, uh, we'll, we'll see a large shift in that particular element. And yes, I think it's all a question of how to learn to really navigate in choppy waters. And this truly, there the water is really, really choppy in many ways. Uh, what's really going to uh, Kickstart industry in various parts of the globe is a question of how consumer demand is re-stimulated. And this is largely going to depend on uh, government stimulus, uh, which will enable this demand to come through. So that's uh, in a brief uh, my, uh, uh, overview. But like I would say, uh, very careful. We are in the midst of wave one. Uh, we need to be mindful there could be a wave two and a wave three uh, while we learn to live with the corona. But I think we'll also have to learn to live with changed consumer behaviors and which will impact uh, industry across the globe in, in a significant manner, I'm sure. Uh, having said this, uh, from a global supply chain perspective, yes, uh, I don't see any shrinking of any global supply chains. It will continue to be strong. What will uh, what'll emerge is how do we leverage technology and processes to get uh, much leaner and much faster at what we do. No, thank you, Gopi. Um, you know, you started out talking about the aerospace sector and uh, civil aviation, and I think that uh, it's unfortunate, but it certainly uh, all signals do seem to point to uh, a longer term structural contraction in the industry. For example, Delta, I think, just recently announced that they were retiring their fleet of 777s. So, uh, you know, that is, as you say, a painful uh, development. Regarding the broader business environment in India, you mentioned the importance of consumption uh, or return of consumer demand. Are there any particular industries you think will benefit in the short term in India? I think uh, there'll be a lot of emphasis on infrastructure. Uh, very clearly, the definition of infrastructure will again change from region to region. Uh, very clearly, there's uh, uh, if there is government stimulus that's going to come through to revive industries, it's going to be largely be led by government spending. And this is going to be a question of what's uh, where, what is the definition of infrastructure in that region. So if you take India for an example, I think you know, very clearly you will see more effort coming in towards uh, uh, the likes of uh, off-road uh, uh, you know, heavy equipment, which would be the excavators and related industries. So you know, you'll see a lot of kickoff on that front followed by some element of uh, building of more, uh, you know, whatever that needs to be done uh, from a physical infrastructure perspective. Uh, you'll also see, uh, I, would, I would be, uh, in my view, uh, there'll be a lot of in emphasis on automation and also for need for equipment and devices, both in telecom as well as uh, uh, the hardware space. And uh, I would tend to think that would also uh, be a 
recipient immediately along with this uh, uh, the pharmaceutical industry of course uh, will have a lot of attention on it for the next uh, couple of years uh, i think uh, these could be the key bits uh, like i said however this all this cannot be a general theme it could it will be a regional theme it will all depend on stimuluses by the government and what industries are forced to you know uh, kind of uh, have a narrative in place in order to receive the stimulus as well uh, it could be for example in some regions it could be the automotive industry where you given 100% depreciation take the vehicles off the road and you know your government allows you to buy new vehicles at over a spread over a period of time for repayment terms it could be quite uh, interesting to watch and see how mm. this pans out great so pay attention to what government is doing and understand the local or regional drivers that affect how the economy may come back great thank you so much gopi now uh we're going to turn to Jason Wu, who is vice president at Corin Group, which is a publicly listed uh, company in China. And they also are a conglomerate involved in several lines of business. And one line of business, I think, that could be of particular interest to our panel and to our audience is they focus on the global business travel market. So uh, Jason, could you share with us your view of how things look from China. Okay, thank you so much, ladies and gentlemen, uh, sirs and madams. Uh, this is Jason Du. Uh, it's my great honor uh, in order to be present here today. So uh, I, I just briefly introduced, uh, introdu I just want to briefly introduce my company, myself, to everyone here. Uh, you know, uh, we are, oh, yes, as um, Mr. Andy introduced, we are one of the global, uh, biggest global travel goods company in the world. Uh, we also, uh, we also is uh, an ecosystem company with Xiaomi. So we, uh, we got IPO, we, we got a past of IPO in 2016. And uh, so we focus on uh, two parts. One is B2B business, second one is B2C business. So uh, due to that, we very, very closely pay attention to uh, this COVID-19 and also uh, what, is going, what is going to happen in the world. So, uh, uh, you know, we have a lot of the, in, you know, in our B2B business, we have uh, our customer like Nike, like the Casanova, like the Samsung Knight, like Dell and HP. So they were also suffered a lot, you know, uh, due to this COVID-19 virus. So, in the beginning, what we did is like, you know, we import uh, the PPE goods, we import like, you know, masks, we import the isolated clothes, and, you know, so we, and then we uh, do, uh, donate, donate to, uh, to them, to Nike, to Decathlon, and to all the governments uh, in China, as well as in, in Japan, and uh, in, in other countries. So, uh, but after that, you know, we found that this virus is not so simple, not so easy. It spreads across the world, not only in China. So, uh, we found that this, as a public, com uh, you know, public company, we have to take, we want, we have to take the responsibility uh, to say, you know, how we can do, how we can support to the, to the, uh, to the world, to the society. So, uh, we did almost uh, 23,000 and 95 masks, and we did uh, no, no, uh, donate 10,000 pieces isolated, uh, isolated uh, clothes and uh, some like other things to to the Nike, to the I know uh, the Casanova, to the governments. Then after that, since since it happened so rapidly, so we also uh, initiate our you know um, PPE and the medical. Uh, uh, business uh, units uh, say like you know we have to do more and have to more involve the people uh, who are around us and we have to utilize our strengths which will I can call supply chain global supply chain since we have uh, uh, global uh, facility facilities uh, in not only in China but also in Indo Indonesia and India uh, so we start the same uh, this kind of this, um, uh, facility in China and to support the government. Then in Indonesia also uh, under uh, government's guidance guidelines. So we start uh, to support, uh, to donate to government. And also on the Indian part, since India also lockdown, 
uh, after this uh, the virus gets spread in India. So uh, we, we, you know, we, when we, uh, the government, in Canada government, they discuss with us, say, uh, since you are making bags, you are making apparel, so maybe you have the uh, uh, potential, you have the ability to make things PPE uh, for, for the government. So we also start uh, two months back in India, and uh, uh, since, uh, then the government gave a special uh, certificate license to reopen our uh, factory to make the uh, mask and to make the isolated clothes to support governments. So um, we were so happy and we were so honored. So it's like you know we can we can join, we can contribute uh, something small uh, to the world, to the uh, to the uh, to the people. So um, uh, like you know, so in China. Um, we start and we we control it quite good, but uh, you know then we want to share, we want to do something and to the other countries, to to the other people to make it better. Uh, this is what our vision. This is also what our mission. So and uh, last and but not least, you know, since I was working uh, in uh, one of the other company in India for three years, so India also uh, is a, so many friends, so many people are there. So I think uh, this is uh, very suffering. This is some uh, difficulties there, but I think this is also one of the uh, you know opportunity to make uh, Chinese and Indian to be more close uh, to do something. And right now and future, yeah, this is my idea. Thank you so much. Great, thank you very much, Jason. And I'd like to ask you the same question that I asked Gopi. Um, so. What do you see as some of the opportunities for Chinese companies in this challenging COVID-19 environment? Okay, so um, I think uh, from my point of view, uh, one of the good things is like, uh, we have, a, actually we have a very strong supply chain ability. So uh, we have also, uh, as I mentioned, we have a B2C business. So we have the like e-commerce, uh, which you know uh, can do something uh, not only the offline, but also you know we can do something through online. So in China companies, since we have the disability uh, to stand to transport uh, the goods from maybe China to other countries. So this is, I think, and uh, for example, my company, like, you know, we have the facility in China and we have the facility in Indonesia, in India. So we, you know, something like, you know, some, um, you know, have some duty issues, you know, from uh, China to other countries, but from India, for example, from India to Japan is duty free. From, uh, you know, uh, from Indonesia to Japan is duty free. So those kind of, uh, uh, you know, um, Preparation, those kind of the network. I think we uh, we can do together uh, based on the Chinese uh, supply chain ability, and also plus, you know, I, I want to plus something like you know we are doing uh, online business. We are the one, uh, you know, uh, our, our company through Timo Group, through Alibaba, and uh, we do we're doing our travel goods like luggage, like suitcase, uh, like bags. So we can uh, send the, the goods. Uh, through our platform and to the people who are needed, who needed this, who need maybe a mask, who need maybe tissue paper, who need some, you know, uh, uh, toilet paper. So we can use our platform and our supply chain uh, to support people. Great. Thank you, Jason. So certainly it seems like there are these, uh, perhaps we could call them regulatory arbitrage opportunities in global trade as well as online, uh, you mentioned e-commerce, and of course, uh, as we're doing today, uh, video conferencing platforms, I think, are enjoying uh, an explosion in usage uh, and demand. Great, well, thank you, all of you. Um, I think if I can briefly sum up uh, what we've learned or what was shared today is that uh, we are really just only in one phase of what looks like a three-phase pandemic of COVID-19 and that certain sectors like aerospace, like civil aviation might see, uh, if not a permanent, but at least a long-term contraction in demand that's going to uh, certainly make certain sectors less attractive relative 
to other sectors. But within that, certainly in places like India, uh, there are still uh, opportunities and potential bright spots that uh, depend on the actions of government and understanding uh, the local conditions. And within a largely negative environment, we still see some great examples of uh, decisive decision making and resilience in the face of these challenges, like with Lenovo, in the ability to utilize its global platform, its ability. Uh, to gain or strengthen market leadership as consumer preferences and demand changes. Uh, and finally, I think as Jason shared with us, there are also opportunities uh, created by regulatory differences, as well as the power of technology that we're seeing that we're able to do things that even four or five years ago would not have been possible. So within this uh, unfortunately, very negative COVID-19 environment still uh, smart and determined businesses uh, like Lenovo, uh, like uh, Thyssen Krupp, like Quorum uh, can respond and perhaps uh, make uh, lemonade when the world gives you lemons. So on that note, I think we will need to stop here and let me turn it back uh, to Huayao and Tabi. And this ends uh, our panel today. Thank you all to uh, my distinguished panelists for taking time from your busy schedule, your insights, and uh, your very, very insightful comments. Thank you. Thank you, Andy. And, uh... Uh, I, I think that we had a really excellent uh, discussion uh, this afternoon, and uh, uh, we really appreciate uh, Ambassador Rao, Ambassador Sun, uh, uh, have actually set the tune. I mean, it's a very positive, it's very constructive, and it's very uh, uh, you know forward-looking. And then we are really backed up by uh, by so many distinguished panelists. Uh, from uh, you know how we can fight uh, pandemics together and experience sharing and how we support each other, and also from this uh, uh, you know global value chain supply chain that we are actually in the same uh, same uh, uh, boat basically we are we are in the same uh, 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 situation so that we can really help each other. Uh, so those sharing those uh, uh, those uh, discussions are fascinating, and I was just uh, was told by my colleagues. Uh, uh, on one platform, uh, that we have several platforms actually uh, carry live in China, and on one platform, we almost got one million viewers uh, around China and uh, uh, internationally. So this is really a great event. I mean, in terms of uh, attracting such a, a large attention. So, in the end, I would like to uh, just to say that uh, uh, China and India really has uh, so many uh, similarities and so many. Uh, ways that we could collaborate closely. I mean, first, we, we are, uh, as uh, Ambassador Sun said, we have a long civilization. You know, India is a long civilization. China is a long civilization. We are, we are really uh, have a long tradition of, uh, of working together. And actually, also, uh, one of the early Chinese uh, returnees, of Xuan Zhang, was, uh, was, was in India, I mean, in the Tang Dynasty, and he brought back the Buddhism from India and uh, actually. Uh, made that uh, very popular in China. So we see a lot of cultural uh, heritage as well. And also uh, uh, that uh, China and India, in terms of a population, we are the mo two most populous uh, uh, country in the world. And we have a lot of similarities in terms of urbanization, in terms of uh, rural development, in terms of infrastructure, in terms of uh, uh, you know, uh, telecommunication, long distance, uh, and now, particularly, we have experience to share on the uh, with each other on these on public health, uh, uh, fighting this coronavirus. So, so I think that uh, there's there's every reason that we should really work together. Uh, I remember also uh, uh, India uh, now uh, has a very good uh, uh, you know movies that uh, has been showed in China has a, a very big tick office, and uh, Chinese people like <laughs> India movies very much. And uh, also, we we have. Uh, uh, Business-wise, we we're here today. I mean, uh, we have uh, Wang Hong said, you know, we we have a, a really uh, India experts uh, actually are those business uh, uh, leaders that uh, are collaborating with India. We also have a Tata in China. We have a lot of uh, 
India companies in China. So there's, there's huge potential. Uh, and also in the future, uh, we should have more student exchanges. Uh, I understand there's, uh, uh, there's, uh, there are some, uh, some Indian students in China, there, uh, you know, there, there should be more also Chinese students in India. We should have more culture, we should have more tourism. Uh, you know, India is such a nice, uh, uh, big, uh, uh, civilized, uh, tradition country and many uh, historic sites that we can see. Uh, so, uh, so I think that China has a 150 million outbound tourists uh, in the before coronavirus. So we hope that we'll be more tourists go to India and more Indian tourists come to China. So, so I think there's many ways we can work. You know, we should simplify visas. We should have, have more airline connections. We should have more uh, close collaborations. Just imagine, you know, being the two largest uh, populous country neighboring each other, uh, we have every reason to, to, collab uh, to collaborate and, uh, and also to work together. And uh, so if this, uh, 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 as, uh, as we, we said at the beginning, uh, Ambassador said that, uh, you know, if Ch uh, China and India uh, combines, uh, you know, it's almost uh, over one third of the world population. You just imagine one third of the world is, is right between us. And, uh, the, uh, you know, why shouldn't we work even closer? So, so I, I don't see any uh, potential conflict. There's no, there's no military, uh, uh, you know, geopolitical or, or any, any other uh, threat from each other? You know, basically we are we are peace-loving country, and uh, uh, I think there's uh, there, there there may be some historical misunderstanding. But I think now, with the economic, with the uh, with all the things going on, we have uh, every reason uh, to to work together. I think we if we really you know think about uh, two biggest giant in Asia, uh, you know, we should really set a good examples on collaboration. So so I think um, you know this afternoon this webinar is a good example of how. Uh, China and India business, academics, public, uh, medical, uh, think tanks can work together. And uh, this is really a, a good way to exchange. So I hope that uh, in the future we could continue the dialogue. Uh, we should try to seek the common ground and minimize the difference. I think the economic benefit uh, and the economic uh, dividend uh, between the two countries will, will unleash the, uh, uh, the more desire to collaborate for both countries. I mean, we need each other. And a lot of China experience, that China has a, a lot of experience gained from, from a heavily, heavily densely populated population in China. And that experience can be uh, uh, exchanged and that can be a benefit to, to India and India experience can also benefit China. So, so I think there's a, there's a lot of ways that we really can collaborate. Uh, so I'm glad that uh, we had a very good discussion uh, this afternoon. And uh, I want to thank uh, Ambassador Rao, Ambassador Sun, and uh, all the distinguished uh, panelists, and also, also particularly to, to my friend uh, Toby Simon uh, as a counterpart to co-organize co this, uh, and also my staff to help in putting this together. So, so it's really a great uh, uh, exchange. Uh, and also uh, so many people, over one million people has been viewing this. So we hope that we, we have more to generate on this. And I want to thank you, you all again for participating in this. So I'd like to pass now to, uh, to Toby, Simon, for your concluding remark. Uh, Toby, please. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Wang Yao, uh, Ambassador Rao, Ambassador Sun, and all the very distinguished panelists. Uh, I, I just don't want to take much time. We have crossed the three o'clock uh, or 5.30 time limit we said, but I can't hear you now. Uh, can you hear me? Okay, now you can. Yeah, no, I, I just wanted to say that India is the first non-communist country in Asia to set up, a, set up the diplomatic relationship with China way back in 1950. Uh, we were planning with CCG to do a conference in India sometime in September, but unfortunately to commemorate the 70th anniversary, but unfortunately, we were, we are handicapped by COVID, but we are sure that this will be rolled back and we will work towards organizing a, a conference, a dialogue uh, later in the year, if should airlines uh, be able to fly. One of the things for me personally as a takeaway is what can we do from now? And I think I would carry the message of Dr. Batson very closely that we have 
so much to share on, on the pandemic. And this pandemic is not going to stop. And, and it is not about academical exercises. This is, as Vaxin uh, said, that it's about sharing experiences. And I think uh, we will try our best to work with uh, CCG to see whether we can extend this platform for doctors both in India, China, and elsewhere to share about you know, what happened so that it, it, it doesn't have to go through other channels. It's a, it's a doctor to doctor, medical fraternity to medical fraternity, public health care experts to public health who can communicate freely. And I think that would be the biggest uh, contribution that we could do and uh, a, a product of our uh, webinar today. And I hope uh, Henry, I mean, Yang Yao, you would support us uh, to make sure that we are able to take the learning further. And finally, I just wanted to, I was reminded of uh, an Indian sage, Bodhidharma, uh, many years ago in the fifth century, we had a sage, Indian prince, who came to China with his uh, martial arts experience and his Ayurveda experience. And the objective, the reason why he came to China was to stop a plague. He's revered in China as Dhamma. So when I, I came and spoke once in China, I asked people, do you know Bodhidharma? They said, no. But I said, do you remember, do you know Dhamma? And most of them said, yes, we know Dhamma. So I think, you know, this is about 1,500 years ago, but I feel there are many opportunities for India and China to work together to build uh, something that we need because these problems like pandemics, etc., cannot be solved by one country as we have seen now. It has to be solved uh, in, a, in a very uh, combined manner by partnering, by collaborating and trusting each other. Otherwise, we, we will not be able to share a, a good future. And with this, I conclude and uh, again, thank you, uh, uh, Wang Hao and all the uh, colleagues in CCG and also to my colleagues, uh, Ambassador Rao and all the panelists, uh, Ambassador Sun, for giving us an opportunity to share some thoughts with you. Thank you very much.